And our presenter will be Dr. Glenda F. Newell Harris. She is a board certified physician in internal medicine. Dr. Newell's diversified experience practicing medicine in the public and private sector for the past 28 years has given her the inspiration and the vision to co-found her own, her own health care consulting company, Newell and Spriggs Consulting, LLC. Committed to teaching the tools that will result in effective communication, savvy navigation, and appropriate advocacy. In addition, Dr. Newell was elected as the national president of the Lynx Incorporated in 2014. Dr. Newell. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I put my phone here not to check messages, but as a timer for myself, um, and usually try to give myself a little bit of extra time at the end. So I want to take this opportunity to thank the Farringtons for inviting me to participate in this wonderful program today. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to be here, and I'm very, very excited about having the opportunity to share with an audience of you handsome men and a few good ladies about prostate cancer awareness. Um, I have, let me pull up my slides here. Now Tom, I may need your help with this setup. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Okay, so I'll just page down and I'm good, okay. So today I have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about caregivers. And I have, um, I have decided that I want to try to talk a little bit about caregivers and also to share a little bit of information with you about another area that we've heard a lot about today, but um, I want to speak about it from a slightly different perspective. So, so uh, I guess I can't really ask for a show of hands about one thing, but let me ask, how many of you have ever been caregivers actually in this room? How many people have actually provided care to a loved one or a family member. Okay, all right. So, so what I wanna do today is just to talk briefly about caregivers, but then also to talk a little bit about advocacy. And this kind of advocacy that I wanna talk about today has to do with your personal advocacy, not the public policy piece, but you being an advocate for yourself. And I want to show you a little bit about the difference between a caregiver and an advocate and show you how there's really kind of a fine line between the two, but also to identify the fact that there can be very, very separate uh, areas. So as you can see, there with this slide here, what are you? Are you a caregiver or are you an advocate? I'm giving you an opportunity to discern whether you are one or the other. But if you take a look, um, it, it's an important role in medical care and treatment, both the caregiver as well as the advocate. Um, it requires a certain skill set, uh, the caregiver and the advocate both, uh, and, then, and then to identify the type of caregiver, there are types of caregivers and then there are types of, of advocates. And there's the basic caregiver and that's the one that comes in and does what we call the ADLs, the activities of daily living, helps to bathe and dress and things of that nature and support. But the complex one I would recognize is somebody that might have a slightly different skill set and that's one that may take your, care, your loved one to the doctor or may actually help with the uh, bills, separating bills, paying bills, and things of that nature. I mean, everybody, you don't let get a hold of your wallet. So you do want to be very, very um, careful about how you identify people that are going to be caregivers. And of course, some of you are caregivers and you're right there, but then there are others of you and us who have loved ones and family members who are distant. And we are, I am, I have a caregiver for my mother that comes in. And uh, some of what I know about caregiving is because I am doing this from afar and it's a challenge doing this from afar. But when I talk to a lot of people, it's a challenge for everybody. So when I'm talking to you about this, I wanna share some of my own stories um, to let you know that it's really very personal and very real. Uh, for me. And then the other uh, thing I want to share is about being an advocate. So there's something that I'm going to identify as a peer advocate and something that I call a professional advocate. So, you know, as you peel down the layers, there are many, many different um, specific areas of both of these uh, particular areas of support. And both of these are things I want to identify are going to be very, very important in your journey as you um, are um, dealing with whatever your condition is, be it prostate cancer, breast, uh, leukemia or whatever. 
So the responsibilities of the caregiver versus the responsibilities of the advocate. Now I've addressed some of these things just a few minutes ago with you. <clears throat> and as you can see, I've left some of the, the ones toward the bottom of separating bills and paying bills and that nature for the caregiver. Now on the advocate side, I wanna talk a little bit about that because that may be the one that you're, the area that you may not be quite as familiar with. And that is on the advocate side, you really wanna make sure that the advocate understands the medical history. It is very important when you're talking about somebody that's going to the doctor with you. We've talked about women going to the doctor. Daughters can go to the doctor. Sons can go to the doctor. Anybody can really be an advocate for you. But that person that goes needs to really understand your medical history. They might, they will hopefully go with you to the, your doctor's appointments. And then at, the, and at that point of them being there with you, it is important that that person helps to make sure you, before you leave that office, that you understand what that medical encounter is all about. I talk often about the importance of taking someone with you to the doctor in particular when you've had or you're expecting some type of results, an x-ray result. Um, and a caregiver is good, a caregiver is good because sometimes your caregivers are your advocates. And what I want to share with you before this is over is to let you know that a caregiver can also be an advocate as well. And in many cases, the caregiver is the advocate. But there can also be lines in between. And so if you have a caregiver, the other point I want to make is you just can't end there because you can't really have somebody there with mom that's bathing and dressing mom and buying her food and then who is really the person that's going to really zero in on that visit with the doctor because mom may not really be tuned in to all the things that the doctor is talking about. It's also important that the advocate coordinate the communication because when you go to the doctor and then the doctor gives you this information that you don't really want to hear, uh, you know, that C word, everything just completely goes out the back door. I mean, what else could you remember except that, uh-oh, this is what I've now got, which is what everybody else has been talking about. But the next line from the doctor may be, and guess what? It's curable, and we've got all these kinds of conditions to treat you with. You don't hear that, but your advocate will hear that. And when you're walking out of the door of the doctor's visit and you're feeling, you know, oh my goodness, how did this happen to me? You might really be able, with an advocate, to be able to say, um, uh, you know, we're going to take care of this. I, I have to say that I'm, I, I was given this opportunity, I think, by Tom and Juarez because I was, very briefly, a caregiver for my own husband, who is a prostate cancer survivor. And I'm very, very pleased and proud to say that he's doing quite well. Um, and he was an easy person to take care of because uh, my husband pays attention to his health. And he goes to the doctor regularly, and he listens to what the doctor says. But I will have to say that when I was there with him at the office, and the doctor gave us that news, and I am a medical doctor, I was quite surprised myself. But I also knew that I needed to not be like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? That's another thing. You know, the app, you got to be the cheerleader. But fortunately, my husband had a doctor that I knew. And the doctor was looking at me because he saw the fear and the worry and the concern. And he kept saying to me, he said, Glenda, we got this. We got this. He said it to me in the office. He said it to me outside the office. And I believed him. And we got through this process. And actually, um, Bob took care of himself. I really wasn't uh, much but a person to say, you know, what time you got to go today? And when do I need to get there? And, you know, and of course, after I went in to, with him to the doctor a few times, I didn't need to show up too many more times because the doctor then began to say, tell Glenda such and such and such a thing and tell Glenda such and such and such a thing because you do need to be there as an advocate. The doctor does need to know that there's somebody else on the other side that's going to be asking questions. I'll have to tell you, one day I walked into the house and, um, and a lab test came spitting out of the fax machine. And I had been calling, trying to get some of his information. And my husband is not like what you've heard about. My husband has no problems with me being in the room, except to say, Glenda, don't be so hard on the doctor, you know, uh, because I have concerns, you know, and I want to make sure he's getting the best care. So uh, all along the way, you know, I had to, I felt I had to be there. Because not all the time is the problem really uh, the, the miss with the doctor. I'll never forget going one time with him and, and he had a medical issue and they needed to do blood cultures on him. And I ran out to park the car and came back and I know how long it takes to draw blood cultures and I know you need to have to put a bunch of betadine on your arm and they draw it and so forth and so on. I came back in, I didn't see any betadine on his arm and I said to the technician, I said, oh, you got the blood cultures? And the technician says, blood cultures? Who ordered blood cultures? I said, well, the doctor ordered blood cultures. Well, the doctor had written it on the form, 
and it had been actually transcribed electronically. So that's when you talk about electronic medical records and how good they are. Well, they're only as good as the people that are going to read them on the other side. <laughs> so the, 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 it was written on the paper. It had been put into the electronic medical record. The electronic medical record had been read by the lab technician, but the technician that took it off of the electronic medical record had failed to pull the slip that was necessary to attach it so the blood culture was about to not be done, and my husband was about to get started on some antibiotics, that once you start the antibiotics, blood cultures are no good. So then you miss your diagnosis. So, you know, another thing, yes, he has a, a wife that's a doctor, but you can pay attention and ask the doctor, what are these things that you're ordering, and check them. I mean, even if it's five, one, two, three, four, five tests. You know, sometimes we can do one vial of blood and it gets two or three tests, but maybe you need to ask the question and maybe before you leave the office, you need to say, okay, now did you get the CBC and the Kim panel and the PSA and this, maybe you need to start asking that question because my motto is taking charge of your health and the only way you're going to be able to take charge of your health is that you've got to get involved and you've got to learn that information. We're not trying to make doctors out of you, but we're just saying you would never send your kids to school to take the SAT with without an SAT prep. So I ask you, when you're getting ready, ask the young people. I have a couple of kids, I got a gazillion children, but at the end of the day, the youngest ones get all their health information, guess where? Not from their mother, from the website. My daughter comes to me and says, well, you know, I've already read about this, but what do you think, so and so and so and so and so. -and -so. My kids wouldn't dream of going to the doctor without reading everything that they can about it on the website. And you may want to do that as well, because the doctor needs to know that you are informed already about your situation. And we do pay attention a little bit differently when we think you have read about it and you're going to ask us a few more questions. Why do I need a caregiver or an advocate? And you can see that I have pictures here strategically shown that one is a one-on-one, -on -one, and the other one, as you see, and I'm going to assume that the caregiver is the wife. And so the advocate is there, she's there to ask the questions, to look and watch and, and observe uh, the kind of behavior that's going on in terms of the engagement between the person that is providing the health information and actually looking at the loved one. How is that loved one receiving that information? That's all part of you being there as an advocate. So caregivers, I've gone over this a little bit. They assist with uh, activities of daily living. Caregivers are great when you have loved ones that are far away. And that way you can kind of um, know that I have a person that comes in and, and helps my mother about three, I think she's there now about three days a week. So I at least know on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my mother's, I shouldn't report it, but most of you don't know her, she's like 96, very proud, lives alone, has for since my father passed over 20 years. And she, um, she's very independent and does what, and really, you know, wants to do her own thing. But I'd like to know at least on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, somebody's knocking on that door to go in and check on her and see how she's doing. So from the standpoint of caregivers, I also have to say that um, you need to be empathetic and sensitive to the patient if you're going to serve in that role. So if you're a person that, um, that doesn't like to share information, you've got to find out how that person that you're caring for maybe likes to share information. I tend to be a little bit more private. My husband is not. And when he started to say that he wanted to share with people that he had prostate cancer, I had to deal with that. I had to process that information. And I was like, oh, Lord, you're going to tell people? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, you have to meet people where they are. And I know that there are people in the Bay Area, Faith Fancher, who has been very public about breast cancer for many years before she passed away. She was a television news anchor. She put it all over the television. She, because she was wanting to heighten awareness about the disease. And that's what today is about, is to let you know, you know, we used to say this in breast cancer, that it was one in 10. So you sit in a room with women, you know, you count one, two, three, four, five, and you're like, oh gosh, am I number 10? There are people in this room that have breast can uh, uh, prostate cancer, and if, you haven't, you might, and it's okay, because we have many things that we can use to treat you, and the treatment is not all of what you have um, heard in terms of maybe negativity. There are many people that get the care and the treatment, um, and they do really, really well. And let me just stop for a moment in terms of caregiving. I think it's also important with men that you share with each other. I heard that they didn't want to share with their spouses. Well, maybe if they don't want to share with their spouses, they need to share with each other. There is a facility in San Francisco where they give radiation uh, to men that are undergoing uh, treatment for prostate cancer. And it's kind of like a man cave. 
And they go in and they have their own little place and it's football, you know, it's TV and it's really wonderful. And sometimes you're more comfortable sharing that with people that you don't know. And so when you're going through the therapy and the treatment, so look toward those types of facilities to get your care, especially if you have to keep going there, uh, you know, five days a week for treatment and so forth. Um, the caregiver is to monitor mobility and make sure you're getting around and to monitor where you're living, make sure that you don't have rugs and things there that would make you trip. Things that you as a, as a daughter or a son may not acknowledge, but a caregiver is trained in looking for those types of things. Advocacy, it's important when you're in that office that you listen. You listen to what the doctor is saying, you listen to the questions, you look to see is the doctor giving eye contact to the patient? If the doctor's not looking at the patient, there's something wrong because the patient actually picks that up too and they're like, well, this person's not really interested in me. So those are things that are really, really important in terms of communication skills. As an advocate, you need to be able to understand how to navigate. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor says to the patient, well, you know, you could get a prostatectomy or you could get, you know, electron, or you could get radiation or you could get shots. Well, you know what? You need to help that patient as the advocate go and take the time to sit down and figure out which one of these therapies that is going to work for you. Don't let them rush you through that process. Um, everybody responds differently to everything, and sometimes I have talked to some men who have said to me, Glenda, I wished I had waited. I had the prostatectomy. I wished I had waited. I wished I had gone another route. I also know some uh, patients that are survivors who have shared with other patients that the new um, Calypso, I'm calling it, it's different in every area, but in my area it's called Calypso treatment, that the Calypso treatment is, um, is um, working as well for some patients. And the Calypso treatment, for those of you who don't know, I am sure Dr. Karen can tell us all about it, but it's that zero in laser focus beam that goes directly to the area of the prostate where the condition is so you don't get all those side effects of, of uh, incontinence and impotence and things of that nature. And so you may go to a doctor that does not have information or resources about that. You need to talk to other people and find out because those therapies are available and they're around. The advocate is to help coordinate the care and help to decode the jargon. So if the doctor starts talking about stuff like I just said, Calypso, they need to break it down. The advocate needs to be there, the caregiver needs to be there to um, explain that. So here, when do I need a caregiver, when do I need an advocate? Well, I would dare say that if you're going through some challenges, depending upon your ability to be able to get around, um, if you're getting around fine, then you probably don't need a caregiver. Uh, but if you live alone or you've had a recent discharge from the hospital or you're having some memory challenges, those are the times that you really definitely want to have a caregiver around. Now, in terms of advocacy, um, personal advocacy, health advocacy, you're going to want an advocate around when, you're, when you've got an undiagnosed medical problem. I mean, if you keep going to the doctor month in, month out, and the doctor keeps telling you they don't know what's going on, you need to go somewhere else. That doesn't mean you need to leave your doctor, but you may need to go and seek an opinion from another provider. And a good doctor is not afraid to lose you, and they will refer you to someone else. Um, delaying of diagnosis. You know, if you go and get a biopsy, and they're telling you it's taken three and four weeks to get the biopsy back, there's something wrong with that. That pathology goes to the pathologist uh, within hours, and that information is read. So they need to be able to get back to you in a timely manner. And if not, you need to get with your, um, your advocate to go with you. Uh, problems with access to care, if they're telling you that you have cancer but you can't get in to see an oncologist for two months, that's not working. You can't accept that, and you have to say, you know what, I care about my health. I really don't feel that it's appropriate for me to wait two months to see someone. You be assertive, and you go and ask for uh, care elsewhere. Um, an advocate will help you to navigate and help you to communicate. Monitoring the care of the caregiver. Now, this is assuming, obviously, that you are not the caregiver. But let me just say, as the daughter of a 96-year-old, it's tough monitoring mom's care from California, but you just need to pop in. I had this with one of my clients last week. Pop in and visit. Unschedule visits with the caregiver. Don't tell them you're coming Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 o'clock because they're going to have mama all propped up, clean, <laughs> breakfast is going to be ready. Right. It's all going to be good. You need to show up. I routinely, not on purpose, but sometimes will only give my mother about a 48-hour notice that I'm flying in. And I have seen some things. And I report it to the agency. 
and mama's had probably about 10 caregivers in the last 10 years. And I don't fire them, the company does. And, and when I come home, they often say, uh, you're the California one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I am the one. You know, mama's got two bathrooms. Why are they only cleaning one bathroom? You're there for four hours. What else are you doing? And then the other thing about the caregivers is they will intimidate these older people. And you know, don't make her mad. Yeah, I don't want her putting poison in mama's food. So you, you know, you give them a little sugar, but you have to watch what's going on. You know, if you start noticing that things are gone from your house, you know, they start to, oh, well, she likes me. I'm giving her such and such and such. So it's, it's a delicate balancing act with these caregivers. But you just need to watch your loved one and see how it's, you know, how the situation is going. And if, if you happen to be in a situation where they're close by, as I've said to some friends that have um, family members in nursing homes, how do, I, how do I get the nursing staff to be more supportive and be more kind to my loved one? Well, you gotta show up. You send you know, your daughter at nine o'clock and you send your son the next day at three o'clock and pretty soon they're gonna say, you know what, with that bed to Farrington, you, you better always be on top of that because they always got somebody coming up in here and you never know. So you can't leave her in a soiled diaper. So you've got to do that. And with the customers and clients that I was talking with about, they said, oh, Glenda, we never thought about that. We just thought it was better to come in the evening when things were less busy, and we never thought about kind of popping in the daytime. You want to know why grandma's not eating? Go check out the food. Show up at lunchtime and see what they're giving her. You may not want to eat that either. That may be why grandma's losing weight. So you've got to be, you know, if you've got caregivers, it's often why people said to me, Glenda, why don't you have a nanny for your children? Well, I didn't, the nanny to me was going to be a third person to be responsible for. I'd have to supervise the nanny to make sure that the nanny was teaching the kids the things that I wanted the kids to learn about. So you've got to think about that. If you've got the caregiver, you've got to supervise what the caregiver is doing. Care for the caregiver. And just closing, let me just say that people don't focus enough on this. Um, you are hustling around and you're trying to do that job and you're trying to make sure your mom or husband or wife has the medication that they need and going to the doctor. And just, I just want to say to you today, you know, be sure to take care of your own health. Because remember, if you're not there, then who really is going to be there to be that caregiver for your loved one? Um, I recommend that you uh, identify relief support. Um, I have to say that when you are in a uh, long-term situation, I had this to happen to a close friend of mine. Her husband was having some mental challenges, and I think they identified it as Alzheimer's, and, and uh, she was just whooped. She was just exhausted. She just couldn't keep it up. And one friend said, contact hospice. Now, this was a mental situation. This was not cancer. And she got hospice involved, and guess what? After about six weeks, they had discharged him from hospice. She said her husband was up empty in the trash can, asking her what was going on. Everybody got better. He got better, she got better, he got discharged from hospice, and it was a great respite and relief. Uh, references, I just want to share with you today that when you're in these situations, I encourage you to take a look at the information that's available on AARP. I have to be so very proud to say that our new CEO of AARP is a sister. And I'm so proud. I met with her yesterday, Joanne Jenkins. So if you don't know, let me be the first to let you know that Joanne is the new CEO of AARP. And she's really trying to engage us in getting to know more about the resources of AARP. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to take a look at your health information. There are resources available there for caregivers and advocates as well. Check with your employee assistance programs in your jobs. Uh, there are some companies that actually will provide you with advocates and navigators through your company to help you through these critical situations because after all, they know when you're not at work, your work is not getting done. So if they can provide you a resource to help you with grandma or grandpa or, or your wife or husband, um, it's really great. I also uh, want to say that um, I, I, ha I am a published author and I have two books that I want to share with you. One of them was written by our dear friend's sister. It's called How to Care for Aging Parents by Virginia Morris. It's available on Amazon and in local bookstores. It's a book that's been around for eight or nine years, but it has incredible resources for you in terms of how to interview for a caregiver, uh, end of life information. It's kind of a resource guide. And then today I actually have, and who's got a birthday today? Anybody have a birthday today? Anybody have a birthday in the month of September? <coughs> okay, wonderful. 
Who, who has a birthday in the month of September? Okay, I have brought two of my books to give as, as door prizes, so to speak. <laughs> so with the two people that have, uh, have identified themselves as birthdays in September, please come up. I've written a book, Focus on Your Best Health, with my uh, colleague. And this is a book that Wonderful. teaches you about the importance of effective communication, savvy navigation, and appropriate advocacy. If you're going to be a caregiver, you're welcome. If you're going to be a caregiver, you need to understand the importance of communicating, navigating the system, and appropriate advocacy. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. We will take a couple of questions for Dr. Newell. Anyone? Okay. Please, please. Uh, Take the mic. All right, we'll have to be brief. <laughs> you use the term calypso treatment. Um, I'm guessing that you were referring to proton. Am I correct? Yes, sir. No. Have the proton know. treatment. You never heard of it? Oh, okay. Um, you know what? I can't tell you a lot about it, but I do know it's an electronic beam. Is there somebody here that's an expert? Okay, it so is a brand. It's just a brand. I, so stereotactic radiation therapy is essentially just a way to kind of give targeted and focused radiation therapy. You may have also heard, I think Accuray was here yesterday. They also have other types of machines that can do the same thing. But it's I just a way to kind of reduce yeah. dose to normal structures surrounding I know Calypso is a musical uh, yes. genre. Right. To, to, to talk about, Correct. you know, Calypso treatment Correct. It was new to me. Thank you. Absolutely. Good morning, I'm Keith Hopkins uh, with the International Longshoremen's Association. And um, I, I had a father-in-law that had Parkinson's and at one time I had to be his caregiver and it was very stressful on me and I actually had to call in and get some help. Um, and I noticed that you said that the uh, caregiver should take time out for themselves. Could you um, Tell me what are the statistics as far as uh, if you would know what the statistics are for the caregiver um, actually, um, because I've heard that sometimes the, the one that they are taking care of outlive them. Yes. I actually cannot quote you any statistics on it, but I will say that um, it has been reported many, uh, many anecdotal, I, I don't have the data to support it, but that yes, many um, caregivers do not uh, the, the, the care person cared for outlives the caregiver yeah. in many situations. You know, I think it, it just kind of depends on the situation. You know, it, we all need to, as I was saying to somebody the other day, we all need to try to take the best care of ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a major responsibility to take care of your own health, all of the visits you have to make. And as we get more senior, we have more places we have to go. Mm -hmm. The eyes and the breast and the, the, the prostate and the genital area and the heart and all of those, you have more doctors. So, um, but it is important and it's stressful taking care of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that stress will kill you. So if you don't manage that piece of what's going on, then stress can stimulate a lot of these other problems that can make you, I think, sicker. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage everybody to create what I call respite time Thank when you. you're doing that. And one other question. Can I get my book autographed afterwards? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I do apologize that I have another engagement. I'm going to have to leave a little early. Yeah. I do apologize for needing to step out. But this has been wonderful, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Let, Thank let's, you. let's give Dr. Doyle a round of applause.